Okay, chapter 19, antitrust policy and regulation. Okay, so the purpose of antitrust laws is to prevent monopolies from forming because once a monopoly forms, there's less competition and also um, it could um, create inefficiency in the allocation of resources. And so, you know, this helps prevent monopolies from forming in certain industries, which then, you know, benefits the consumer because the more industry, the more companies there are in a certain industry, the higher the competition is, the lower the prices for the consumer, and the more choices a consumer has. Okay, so just a little bit of history. Okay, so after the Civil War, a lot of companies that were just in local markets were able to expand um, nationally. Okay, and this was due to better transportation facilities, uh, better corporate structures, and also production methods were greatly improved. So several industries such as sugar, coal, meatpacking, um, a lot of dominant firms form in these industries and, and you know, they were either in, you know, oligopolies, near monopolists or monopolists, okay? And so they were called trusts. And trusts are business combinations that assign control to a single group, okay? So if there's only like three or four companies in that industry, then they would form a trust and they would all make a business decision together, Okay, and so, you know, the problem is, is back then there wasn't any regulation. And so, you know, they would acquire, these dominant firms would acquire smaller firms using questionable business practices. And this also led to extremely high consumer prices. And so consumers, you know, started to get very unhappy. And so they, you know, started going to the government and saying, hey, you know, this has to stop. And so... With this, regulatory agencies were started. If the firm was a natural monopoly, then the regulatory agency would um, establish certain laws to control the behavior of the monopolist to make sure that the price was fair for consumers. And then also, antitrust laws were started as well. And you know, the goal of antitrust laws was to prevent the monopoly from gaining more power. Okay, so the first antitrust act was the Sherman Act of 1890, and it was very broad. There was only two sections, and section one outlawed what we call restraints of trade, anything that made trade harder. So for example, um, collusive price fixing, where firms get together and agree on one price and also prevented monopolization. And then the second act of the antitrust uh, gave the government power to potentially break up these monopolies. However, it was very vague, and it was subject to court interpretations, and it was very hard to prosecute a monopolist under this act. So the Clayton Act built upon the Antitrust Act, and they outlawed price discrimination, when it reduced any type of competition. It also prohibited tying contracts, which is something that uh, Microsoft was prosecuted for. And essentially what a tying contract is, is that it requires a consumer, if they purchase one good, then they have to purchase an additional good or service with that good. So like in the case of Microsoft, you know, they sold their... Microsoft Office, and they charged a higher price for the package that had Netscape as their web browser than the package that had Internet Explorer, which is Microsoft's own browser. Okay, and so the court found that to be unfair business practices and found that to be a way to try to drive Netscape unfairly out of the market. And so, you know, they fined Microsoft for that. They also prohibit acquisition of stocks of competing corporations. So, you know, one corporation cannot um, buy the stocks of another corporation to try to reduce outcome since owning stock means you also have a share and an interest in what the competitor does. 
And then also they prohibit it interlocking directorates. Okay. So a director of a firm cannot be a board member of a competing firm. Okay, this would be a conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. So the Federal Trade Commission Act was also established in okay, and they were given the power to investigate unfair competitive or business practices okay, at the request of firms that felt they were being victimized by other firms' practices. Okay. And then the Wheeler-Lee Act of 1938 okay, also gave the Federal Trade Commission the power to police deceptive acts or practices in commerce. Okay. So it can help protect the public against companies that have false or misleading advertising and also misrepresentation of products. Okay. And then the seller Kevoffer Act of 1950. This amended the original Clayton Act in Section 7, where it's, which prohibited the acquisition of stocks. So firms would constantly evade this section by instead acquiring the physical assets of competing firm. And so the seller can offer act close that loophole. Okay. So one firm cannot acquire the physical assets of another firm because it would reduce competition. Okay. And so antitrust policy has been a bit inconsistent because it's subject to interpretation. And so, you know, they Officials try to look at monopolist behavior versus monopolist structure. Okay. So, in 1911, Standard Oil was found guilty of monopolizing the the oil industry through um, unethical practices. Okay. So, the court ruled that Standard Oil be divided into several competing firms. Okay. So, it broke up that monopoly there, all right? But in 1920, with the U.S. Steel case, okay, um, the court ruled that even though the U.S. Steel was pretty much a monopoly, it never engaged in deceptive acts against competitors, and so therefore they were a good, honest monopoly, and they could stand as they were. In 1945... Um, the Alcoa case. So Alcoa had 90% of the aluminum in got market, and they were found to be in violation of the antitrust laws as well. Not because of any bad business practices, but just because of how much market share they had and just how big their size was. So it's, you know, it, ha- it hasn't been consistent. So, you know, U.S. Steel was found to be, yes, it's a monopoly, but they didn't engage in any unethical business practices, so they're allowed to stand, whereas Alcoa, same thing, except they were not allowed to stand. And so, you know, structuralists will say that any firm with a high market share should be broken up because they will behave like a monopolist. And if you recall, monopoly charges a price that's above marginal revenue equals marginal cost. You know, it benefits the monopolist. It doesn't benefit the consumer as much. Okay. Behavioralists say, you know, if they're not engaging in any unethical business practices, then the monopoly should uh, stay. Okay. So courts have to decide how much market power exists, and they usually adhere to a 90-60-30 rule. So if a firm has 90% market share, then it is a monopolist. If it has 60% market share, it may be a monopolist, more on the probably is a monopolist side. And if it's a 30% market share, it is not a monopolist. So, you know, they have to look at the market in which the monopolist operates there. So in 1956, okay, DuPont's was brought to court because they controlled 100% of the cellophane market along with a licensee. 
But the court allowed this because DuPont also sold other products such as wax paper, aluminum foil. And so they said that, okay, in the cellophane market, yes, DuPont has 100% market share there. But in the other markets for, you know, in the broad term of flexible wrapping materials, it only had a 20% market share. So they said that DuPont itself is not a monopoly. Now, there's been issues of enforcement, and this is mainly just because different administrations have different views on monopolies. So an administration that believes any type of monopoly is bad will be much harder on monopolists than any administration that's more laissez-faire, meaning hands-off, you know, let the market do its work and correct itself. If the monopoly grew naturally and over time, you know, not through deceptive business practices, but because it was, you know, they expanded and there was no real strong competitors to keep them small. The government tends to be a little bit more lenient. Um, let's look at two cases. In AT&T, um, the government said that AT&T did violate the Sherman Act by engaging in some anti-competitive practices. So it forced AT&T to split up into 22 regional telephone operating companies. So in that case, you know, it wasn't so lenient because they was found guilty of some anti-competitive practices. But in Microsoft, even though they also engaged in anti-competitive practices, um, they weren't forced to divest or break up into smaller companies. Also, the way they treat mergers. Okay, so there's three different types of mergers, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Okay, so a horizontal merger is when two companies or more that sell the same type of product merge together as one. So it can be two companies that produce basketballs and they merge together as one, com one company. And, and those type of mergers are much cl closely followed by the government and prosecuted than vertical mergers or conglomerate mergers. Because with horizontal mergers, since it's the same type of good, then the merch company would control what they would say too much of a market share. So, you know, the government recently blocked uh, AT&T's attempted merger with T-Mobile, citing that they would have too much of a, or too large of a market share and that it would prohibit competitiveness. Though they don't always block horizontal mergers, but they tend to be a little tougher on those. Vertical mergers, okay, is a merger between firms at different stages of the production process. So in this example, okay, firm Z produces denim and firm F produces blue jeans, okay. And so, you know, firm F usually buys denim from firm Z and now they have merged together as one company and this usually helps lower costs. And the government tends to leave those alone more because it doesn't usually decrease competition in their respective industries, you know, so the denim industry and the blue jean industry. However, in the case with Barnes & Noble, they did block that vertical merger. They wanted to, uh, Barnes & Nobles wanted to merge with Ingram Book Company and Ingram Book Company is a wholesaler. And so, that merger would have allowed Barnes and Nobles to set the wholesale price of books. And so Barnes and Nobles could have charged a higher wholesale price, for example, to their competitors like Amazon, Borders, and other bookstores. And so the government did not allow that merger to go through. Conglomerate mergers is when two companies in completely different industries merge together. So in this example, it would be Company C that produces autos merging with company D that produces blue jeans, okay? And usually the government allows those to go through because they don't lessen competition. And so they will look at the Herfindahl Index, which we did discuss in earlier chapters, and you know, the higher the Herfindahl Index that a merger is predicted to cause or have, you know, the merge company would have, then usually 
the government tends to be a little bit harder on those potential mergers. Now, the government is tough on price fixing. And so, you know, if other firms collude together to set a higher price on all their goods, so if all airlines collude, for example, to charge um, a high price on their flights to, let's say, New York City, then usually the government is very tough on situations like that. Price discrimination, is it's hard to determine if it's actually lessening competition. You know, usually, for example, charging a lower price movie ticket to senior citizens and students doesn't decrease competition. So the only time um, the government's harder on those is if the price discrimination is aimed at blocking new competitors from coming into the market or uh, trying to drive out existing competitors. And then tying contracts. So this, again, the government will usually prosecute firms that do tie contracts because this gives the firm an increase in market power and decreases competitiveness. So for example, Kodak was not allowed to require that their customers process their film only through them. Okay. So customers before, you know, they were trying to say you can buy Kodak film, but you can only process it through a Kodak facility, but the but the government said that is unethical and did not allow it. Okay, so industrial regulation, and this is to prevent a monopoly from engaging in abusive practices. So in the case of a natural monopoly, a natural monopoly exists when there's economies of scale. Basically, when one firm can service the market at a lower average total cost than several firms can. And so the government will allow that because it is good for consumers. Okay, so a lot of public utilities, such as electricity, water, gas, phone, they are natural monopolies. And so the government allows them to operate as a monopoly as long as they have a say in the prices. They don't want these natural monopolies to charge exorbitant prices. So, for example, we need water, and so our demand for water is very inelastic. So we would be willing to pay a much higher price, but the government sets a price that is more fair, but also a price where the natural monopolist can also have a normal profit. Okay. And so, you know, some solutions is, you know, the government can own the monopoly. So, for example, the Postal Service is a monopoly that is publicly owned by the government or a near monopoly. And then they can also regulate natural monopolies that are private. And so they can set the rates at a fair price. And so the public interest theory of regulation is the theory that industrial regulation is needed to prevent the monopolists from charging monopoly prices that are very high and do not benefit the consumer, especially if it's in an industry where demand's very inelastic. So like, we, you know, we need electricity, we need water, we need gas. And, you know, these monopolists could get away with charging extremely high prices. And so the theory says that the government needs to step in and regulate them to make sure prices are more fair. Okay. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was established in 1930, and they regulate electricity, gas, gas pipelines, oil pipelines, water-powered sites. The Federal Communications Commission was established in 1934, and they regulate telephones, television, cable television, radio telegraphs, CB radios, and ham operators. And then state public utility commissions you know, regulate electricity, gas, and telephones. Okay, so some of the problems with industrial regulation is that the regulators establish the rates that they can charge to consumers and they want to make sure that the monopolist will have a normal profit. Okay, however, because of this, there's no incentive to reduce costs because if the monopolist were to find a way to reduce costs, 
then the government would also make them lower their rates as well. So they wouldn't see the benefit of decreasing costs in their profit. So therefore, since there's no incentive to reduce costs, they are operating at X inefficiency. And just a reminder, this is where production is, or output is being produced at a cost, average total cost that is higher than the lowest average total cost. Another problem is that they could perpetuate the monopoly. Um, and, you know, sometimes it makes sense for a natural monopoly to occur, but then over time, conditions change, there's new technology, and so that industry would actually benefit from competition, but it may be a long time before the government recognizes this and allows competitors to come in and deregulate the industry. Mm -hmm. And then some monopolists want to be regulated by the government. And this is part of the legal cartel theory of regulation. And this is where, again, some industries want regulation. And so that way they can either stay a monopoly or at least form a cartel. And that way they can charge higher prices. And, and because the aim of the government is for these monopolists to have a normal profit, then they are insured a normal profit because the government will allow them to charge the higher price and prevent competitors from coming in. Okay, Beginning in the 70s, due to um, the inefficiencies of regulation coming up, a lot of industries started to be deregulated, Okay, such as airlines, railroads, telecommunication, electricity. And most of them have produced a lot of benefits for consumers and society, you know, increased competition and lower prices, increased net output. However, you know, there has to be some care taken because, you know, there are industries that started to engage in unethical business practices such as Enron, and that created a large amount of loss for people. Also, the financial crisis of 2007-2009 showed a lot of evidence that some regulation is good to prevent firms from engaging in bad business practices. Okay. Social regulation applies to a lot more firms than industrial regulation. And so, you know, this is applied across the board to all industries, in other words. And this is regulation on firms to make sure that they are providing um, good products to consumers, not, not products that can endanger them or make them sick. And this is important. I know there's been a lot of tests done, for example, on vitamins lately, and a lot of times they found that vitamins do not contain what they say they do. And so essentially, consumers are spending their money for nothing. Okay, so the Food and Drug Administration regulates safety and effectiveness of food, drugs, and cosmetics. Equal employment opportunity, they prevent discrimination against workers. Occupational Safety and Health Administration focus on industrial health and safety. They'll go to, for example, plants and factories and make sure that workers um, are wearing the correct gear, etc. Environmental Protection Agency, um, they, they help regulate air, water, and noise pollution. You know, they want to make sure air isn't over polluted and water isn't over polluted. Consumer Product Safety Commission, you know, ensures the safety of consumer products, for example, making sure car seats are safe. And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau started in 2011. This was their response to the financial crisis, and this um, gives the government an ability to regulate lending and other financial services to make sure that people, firms are engaging in ethical lending practices. Uh, of course, the optimal level of social regulation would be where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Okay, so those in support of social regulation say that this helps society stay safe. This helps save lives, for example. Keeping workplace safe um, saves lives. Um, 
making sure our food supply is not contaminated, again, saves lives. Requiring that children have car seats saves lives. However, there are criticisms. And of course, one of the criticisms is that it's costly for companies to comply with these regulations. And also, sometimes it leads to a bad trade-off. So for example, um, now that automobiles have a federal gas mileage standard, car manufacturers responded by making lighter automobiles. And so there's been an estimate of two th to 4,000 traffic deaths a year because the cars are lighter weight now, not as safe. And so when they get in an accident, the drivers are and the passengers are more likely to die than before, all so they can meet this federal gas mileage standard. In the end, there's always a trade-off. Um, social regulation does come with a cost, um, a monetary cost. It does increase product prices because firms pay money to comply with these regulations. However, you know, in preventing another financial crisis, for example, um, we do need some level of regulation to make sure firms are engaging in ethical business practices. All right, this concludes Chapter 19.